So, let us then go now to the tutorial. This is the first passage. Okay, I want to read it for you. You can see any vapor by the strength of the light diffused by the individual particle. And the more particles you have, the stronger the diffusion. From the strength of the diffusion, you can actually count the number of molecules. I use the word counting not like 1, 2, 3, 4. It is a different type of counting. When I was in the currency office, they used to count the rupees. You know what they did? They did not count the rupees. They counted the bags. They weighed the bags. Each bag was supposed to contain 2000 rupees that had to be taken on trust. And then multiply the number of bags and you get a crore, 10 million of rupees. Like that, you count the molecules of the atmosphere. It is only a sort of estimate. Okay? This is passage 1. This is passage 2. Method of approach to the problem of molecular scattering, which is somewhat different from Raleigh's and which enables the case of liquids to be included, is the theory of fluctuations developed by Einstein and Smolichowski and used by the latter especially to elucidate the optical phenomenon observed in the vicinity of the critical state. In this theory, the medium is regarded as undergoing small local variations of density owing to the irregular movements of the molecules and the result of these fluctuations of density is that a certain proportion of the instant light is scattered. Okay? Question. What do you think about the intended audience for passage 1 and passage 2? Yes. Passage 1 is uh, most probably for liquid energy. Hmm. Uh, energy hmm. And the passage 2 has been word for the journal or article kind of stuff. Article. Okay. Everybody agrees? Okay. So, there are clear markers to say and both are from Sir C. V. Raman. The first one is a beautiful article, you should go look it up, why the sky is blue. He is talking to school children in Ahmedabad or some place for, uh, for the academy meeting. Yeah. And the second one is from his article about why the uh, sea is blue. Okay. So, that is published in some proceedings of Royal Society. Audience, you will change the tone. You will change the words. You will change the way you say things. Okay? You, they, you will change the way you use the examples. Okay? In the scientific article, he is not going to write about his experience in the currency counting office. Okay? But, but in, with the students, he will say it. And Raman, I found, is one of the best examples of the way he changes when he projects information. There are technical papers about light scattering in diamond. There are articles in the Hindu in those days about diamond extremely different in tone, extremely different in the way they communicate information. You might not realize uh, uh, this, uh, but the, the two information are basically the same. In fact, Einstein's PhD thesis was on counting the number of molecules using light scattering and that is what he is describing to the children in the other uh, this thing and that is the same thing he is describing here. Okay. So, to take such complex information and put it across, is a huge effort and I always found that Raman to be very good at doing this. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, um, online resource does not exist. Uh, RRI used to have all his writings, technical and non-technical. So, it used to be such a pleasure to read some of them. Previously, it was I wrote to their librarian, but she has not responded yet, okay. saying that where is this, because I wanted to share it with you, so you can go look up, you can use it as examples. Uh, but some of it is available. For example, he has nice articles, technical articles about Veena and Mridangam, Tabla and things like that, so which are available for download, you can download and read. Which also I like because for this kind of audience. Uh, no, Raman, so that, uh, Raman effect you are going to talk about that, Mridangam and all this. Raman effect, yeah. Uh, no, Raman effect is from uh, light uh, passage through liquids, but Mridangam and all, he has done some experiments. So, you will put some powder, you will make them vibrate and show what kind of patterns they develop and things like that. Okay. Okay. So, so it is very clear what the intended audience is and you can also explain why. Okay. So, you should always do this as a game, you know. Can I look at some passage and guess? How many times do I get it right? Sometimes you do not get it right because the author has not done a good job of it. That is also possible. But So, let us look at this. Okay, before I do this, I actually want to show you something. This is a paper, very famous paper, uh, written by Watson and Crick, 
when they figured out the double helix structure of DNA. There are two things that I want to point out to you about this article. The first thing, it's, this is all very short. In those days, nature, this was all one page. You know, Romans is one page and this is one page. The first is that if you look at the structure of the paper, for example, if you just read the first lines of each paragraph, we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid. A structure for nucleic acid has already been proposed by Pauling and Corey, right? And then you go down. Another three strain structure has also been suggested by Fraser. We wish to put forward a radically different structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid, right? So you can just read the first lines of the paragraphs. And they have structured it beautifully so that you can follow what they want to do, what is the background, what is it that they are doing, how they are doing it. Okay. This is the nicer part of the Watson Crick article. But they are also nasty. The one here, for example, this is a single paragraph. This is a very famous sentence in science because, see, they have solved the structure. Now, they are claiming that the genetic information is passed on because of this structure. They don't have the details. But if suppose they didn't write this line, somebody else, all they have to say is they have proposed a structure that can do genetic information. So they want to claim priority for thinking of this as the mechanism for genetic information transfer. So this is where they are cunning. They write, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material supposedly one of the best understatements in, in literature. And the next line also is something that all of you might do. This is where I said, if you have something else which is not fitting in the narrative, what do you do? You say that it will be published elsewhere, which is what they are doing. Full details of the structure including the conditions assumed in building it together with a set of coordinates for the atoms will be published elsewhere. Now the last paragraph is the nasty thing that they did. Do you know what they did? Anybody here knows what they did? So there was a researcher called Rosalind Franklin. Uh, she was doing experiments and she also pretty much figured out, but Rosalind Franklin is very conscientious. Okay? She would not publish unless she does the experiment several times, confirms that it is so, but they were in a hurry to get credit. Okay? And by one line acknowledgement, they sort of made sure that Rosalind did not get Nobel Prize. We have also been stimulated by a knowledge of the general nature of the unpublished experimental results and the ideas of Mr. M. H. F. Wilkins and Dr. R. E. Franklin. R. E. Franklin is Rosalind Franklin. If I remember correct, I think Wilkins was part of the gang that got Nobel Prize, but Rosalind didn't. But if you go to this nature version, uh, uh, the following article is on experiments and the next article is actually by Rosalind Franklin. So this is also a very maybe successful way of communicating science. But I feel that this is not a great way of doing science. The world is a big place. We don't have to you know, crowd out others. I would have respected Fra Crick and Watson even if Rosalind Franklin also got Nobel Prize with them. right? So there are lots of articles. You can look at uh, resonance. There are a series of articles about Rosalind Franklin. and uh, the, the, So in the scientific community, it is known that they did it and uh, they are accused of lots of things. Again, there is a book called Double Helix, extremely well written, very controversial for some of these things, the way they describe the interactions with Rosalind and the way they try to sort of indicate that she really was not uh, doing great or something like that. But as technical writing, unbeatable writing, here are some people who are not good role models for you in professional ethical sense. But certainly good role models from the point of view of how to write. I mean, look at that. Each paragraph, each sentence, you can just read the topical sentences and you will carry the paper with you. So this is the other exercise I had in mind. So I have done it. So this is the first sentences and these are the tricky sentences. This is the last tricky sentence. Okay, so this is a kind of paragraph writing style which is uh, uh, sometimes recommended. This is not the only style. There are also places where the last sentence of each paragraph can give you. Sometimes people mix. First sentence, topical sentence will be there for some paragraphs and some others will be 
the last sentence. So you can do whatever works for you. You need to write a few times and see what sounds better and what conveys your flow of thoughts and what does it uh, in, in a fashion in which you want it to be conveyed. Okay. Okay. So we are going to complete this uh, pretty soon. You should have a good dictionary. In fact, you should have several good dictionaries with you and one or two atlas. Okay, that is very old style thing. Nowadays with Google, nobody wants to look at atlas anymore. And sometimes not even dictionary, you know, people just look up and... Uh, but I still recommend that you buy a good dictionary. Okay, there are lots of things that are there in the dictionary which is still not part of online culture. Now, if you are not looking up dictionary, at least once in two or three days, that means that you are not reading to your potential. You are never too old for not looking up the dictionary. If you are not looking up the dictionary, then your reading material is not on par. Your linguistic capability is what you can do. You are not reading at that level. That's what it means. So a good dictionary and usage of it is very, very essential. Uh, when we were in school, they even taught us uh, whatever phonemes, how to read and things like that. These days, that is not very difficult because online there are places where you can click and hear uh, and, and, and you can get the pronunciation. But it is still a good idea to have a good dictionary. Okay, here again, people are very particular. Some people like Webster, some people like Cambridge, some people like Oxford. What I'm telling is that you know the common thing which is uh, to everyone, am I right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I'm telling. I mean, people have different opinions. I come from Oxford gang, so I always have two, three Oxford dictionaries with me. But that is not something that is universally recommended by everybody. Some people like Cambridge, uh, some people like uh, Webster's. Yeah, so Oxford has an academic writing dictionary. Oxford has an advanced learner's dictionary. Cambridge also has advanced learner's dictionary. And then the full complete English dictionary is there. And I think Oxford, the complete dictionary is running into some... Thesaurus is uh, just uh, this thing. Dictionary itself is about 13, 14 volumes and costs about 10,000, 12,000. That is only for libraries. But personal copy, there is one which is available for 800, 900 bucks, uh, some um, lakhs of words. So, so academic writing, there is one. But not for technical communication. But there are dictionaries of metallurgy, for example, dictionaries of chemistry, dictionaries of physics. So there are subject dictionaries and then there is academic writing dictionary. Oxford, Cambridge. Uh, Oxford has an academic uh, dictionary. Academic writing dictionary. Uh, dictionary of academic writing. Okay. So you have to subscribe to some good technical journal. If you are teaching technical communication, uh, please subscribe to some technical journal. Resonance is something that I like. Even from my college days, I have been reading. It's a very good journal. It's published by Indian Academy of Sciences. The biggest advantage is you don't have to pay. It's available on online for free from the Springer site. Okay, Academy, Resonance. It's journal of Science Education, it's called. Uh, it's from the Indian Academy of Sciences. The volumes are available for free. And Wired and Economist, sometimes Economist has, you know, odd about admitting it, but they have their obituary session which is probably the best description in four lines about any field. Somebody who has passed away who is an architect or somebody who is an economist or somebody who is a chemist, a science, biologist, four or five lines. They will explain what is the person's contribution and I have never seen anybody else doing it so beautifully, whether it is in your area or not. Okay. So learn later, which is very important. And there are pro, uh, plotting software called GenuPlot, Octave and things like that. And there are statistical analysis software called R, which is primarily used by biologists. And uh, you should all have a lab notebook and you should insist that your students have a lab notebook in which they write everything, what they did, how they did, when they did, why they did, what they expected, what they got, why they think they got what they got. And please use a spell checker. Previous days, somebody has to edit and look at your this thing. Nowadays, it is not. But when you are using a spell checker, please be consistent. Sometimes there is an UK spelling. Sometimes there is an American spelling. And your spell checker indiscriminately gives. Right? So, but if you are used to writing the British spelling, some of the words will be in British spelling. So, you should consistently use and your spell checker format. You should tell which English you are using. And you should be used consistently. And uh, this is something that I recommend. <laughs> uh, 
uh, there are lots of online courses about technical writing. Okay, Stanford has one by a professor called Sainani, which I have done. Uh, part, at least part of it I have done, not completely. No MOOC course of mine I completed ever. But uh, there, there are lots and lots of resources. But because there are lots of resources, again, it is very difficult to know which ones are standard. Many of them give wrong advice, like this passive voice and don't use I, me and things like that. So some of them you have to be careful. So you should know the veracity of the information and you should use which ones are standard. Uh, but there is also manuals of style. There is Chicago manual of style. And so, so there are also manuals of style. But once you get into this business, you will know. Uh, there is this book called Strunk and White, Elements of Style, which is uh, universally recommended. But I know of several respected linguists who think that that book is bogus. But they instead recommend the Steven Pinker's uh, uh, Sense of Style. It's a very good book. Not very costly, few hundred rupees, but it is worth having. And once you are in the business, you know, once you start doing this, pretty much, uh, pretty soon you will also know what other things. So there is another book which describes the same incident in 100 different ways. Sense of Style by Steven Pinker. Okay, what I will do is, uh, the, the books that I have along these lines, I will make a list, I will share it with Sundar so that all of you can get it and it will also go online. Uh, so Strunk and White is what generally people recommend, but there are linguists who take strong objections to Strunk and White. Similarly, I mean, when we were children, we were taught Ren and Martin and Fowler and Fowler, modern English usage, whatever. Uh, but nowadays, I don't know how popular Fowler is, but I do see some criticism of some of the rules of Fowler. But I think that is simply because Fowler was written long back. Uh, the, our uh, things have changed, you know, the way we look at English language has changed. Okay. So there are, there are differences, uh, but uh, again, I am not trained in English, so I don't know much. I know only what I used and what I use now. See, what we have been talking about is good technical writing. Okay. Where does the good technical writing comes from? Okay, it comes from a scientific attitude you should have. What is the scientific attitude? You believe that there is a simpler principle from which you can explain what is happening. Now, if you start from a simpler principle and if the explanation is available for the existing phenomena, then you are done and you will accept that explanation. If that is not there, you still think that in terms of maybe the same or other simpler explanations, you can explain the observed phenomena. We are not talking about things which are not observable. Science and engineering is empirical. There is no place in it for something which is not empirical. For example, if you tell me that this is a way of doing this, but I am not able to go test it myself for whatever reason. You might say that, you know, that particular material is no longer available. Then it becomes history and anthropology and it's not science. Everything that I say, I should be, and, and similarly, you can't say, with your knowledge, you can't understand this. That's not science. You can say, you need to know these, these, these to understand it. If I do that, I should be able to understand. That is the first thing. The second thing is curiosity. You want to know why, I mean, you know, why, why the sea is blue. Who cares? You can write poetry about the blue of the sky and blue of the sea and go away. But as a scientist, I am not satisfied with only that. I also want to know why. And not just that, the why should be an explanation in terms of simpler principles. Why can't be something like that is how it was made by God. That explanation is okay in certain contexts. Okay? In some contexts, I do believe God made it this way and I am happy about it. But when I am doing science, that is not how I would look at it. Okay, so curiosity, commitment to follow the truth wherever it takes. You know, sometimes some of the answers that comes from science is not comfortable for me, for whatever reason. Okay, I believe that this is the reason why this uh, experiment is giving this result and uh, you know, repeated experiments show me that that is not the reason. I should be willing to accept that yes, I was wrong, yes, this is the new reason. Okay, sometimes people say, why mathematics is too difficult? Because it is very difficult not to make mistakes. If that is all there to it, it's not a problem. Maybe everywhere people are making mistakes. But in mathematics, it's very difficult not to accept a mistake once it is realized as a mistake. So science is also like that. The difficulty in science is mostly because of the way we approach things. And a good scientific attitude means that whatever result I get with these, I will accept them, however difficult it is for me to accept. And a commitment to communication. Science does not happen. It becomes magic 
if i know how to do something i even know the principle but i don't tell you then that is not science that is magic i can always come and show and then you know everybody will be surprised but science happens the moment i also start explaining why or how or how you can understand or how you can use the same principle to go beyond and do something else and the enthusiasm for what you are doing science involves lots of drudgery be it experiments be it coding be it writing okay be it communicating or understanding you can't do it unless you are really enthusiastic about doing it and you should also have lots of respect for those who work before you that is shown in terms of giving proper attribution to them however small they are no it's not like it's uh, uh, okay to plagiarize from some smaller person because no what does that person it doesn't matter it might be the student who joined your phd program yesterday it might be a well established scientist whoever it is you are not taking somebody else's work and if we take we always give due attribution to them and we believe that scientific community will do the same to us that is very important if you don't have that kind of respect for your fellow human beings who are involved in this process i don't think good communication will happen and the urge to push the boundaries I'm not happy with what it is now i want to go slightly beyond and once you start thinking like that then it means that you will understand a lot you will understand ways of pushing the boundary and then science automatically happens and then if you have the flair the communication also happens out of so i'm going to stop at this point and if you have any questions i will take it but in the meanwhile i wanted to leave you with a thought we, we can discuss this is just for, for me to show you is there anybody here who doesn't know what pythagoras theorem is so pythagoras theorem basically tells that if you have a right angle triangle and if this is a this is b and this is c c squared equal to a squared plus b squared yes or no i mean you can correct me my pythagoras theorem is correct okay correct very good so now suppose you want to explain you know my mother hasn't done say or my grandmother hasn't done schooling i have to explain to her what pythagoras theorem is or you want to explain to your daughter who is in elementary school or you have a cousin who is in high school there are many problems i, I don't know there is also this approximation sin theta is nearly equal to theta for small theta so how would you explain that to your uh, grandmother so by drawing rectangles of length right there are many many nice ways yeah yeah there are youtube videos where they will take the uh, the things yeah geometry book in our very good very good okay so 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 you can think i mean this is an exercise that you can think about but this need not be pythagoras theorem it could be any concept that you want to communicate but all that i am trying to say is that you should think of three different types of audience one is you know more or less all the technical stuff is known to them communicate a concept another one who doesn't know the technical concept but you can you know tell them what the technical concept is and explain that is another possibility the third one is they don't have any technical information so even the basic technical information has to be translated into plain english and you have to build from that so it's a good exercise and uh, we will do more of this exercise both online and uh, during the uh, sessions in december so i i also hope that you have noticed what the tutorial sessions are going to be like when you will be at the other end and you may have to engage with your audience and these are the things that i would like you to convey so that they can also do this exercises Uh, we didn't have much time so the exercises i actually rushed through then many of you wanted to say things but i had to cut short uh, hopefully during that time there will be more chances for us to interact so if you have any questions comments yes sir general question sir yeah first of all uh, thank you very much for your original ideas on technical writing and uh, my question is uh, there was a dictum called uh, publish or perish in those days later on uh, uh, faculty members of institutions like you we have to get uh, funding and later on patent what is now what is the current trend sir i want to know about from you as you are in the premier institutions no we would like to publish as much as possible 
we also would like to get as many patents as possible but uh, somewhere along the line there is also the question of quality and it is not a question that is just related to science again i think of you know what is the markandeya story is there anybody who here doesn't know markandeya story yeah you can always you, the boon is that you will get 100 children who are useless or you will get one child who is great okay you are supposed to choose the good child sometimes we tend to choose numbers over quality the moment that happens i think we are failing in several levels we are failing the public who are funding us we are failing the scientific community which is dependent on us because next generation students are getting trained here we are failing science overall for this country because if you just get numbers but they, if they are of no use what is it that we are going to do with that science right so my personal view point again this is a personal view point is that research is a very personal activity teaching is a common activity i get paid for teaching i get my salary because i have been given these these courses to teach in those courses they have put the curriculum they know what is expected and i run exams i check if the expectations were met by the students the ones who meet the pass the ones who don't fail and repeat but research is a personal thing and because it is a personal thing there are no rules there are only guidelines okay so what do i think about publishing lots of papers i think you should publish lots of papers now how many is considered as lot as many as you can publish without compromising on quality now that will be dependent on person dependent on students dependent on facilities dependent on your area and so we should only check for each person according to these constraints if the person is doing the best or not but they are also very subjective there is no objective measure okay so because of which i think that's what i was telling impact factor for example people talk about but some of the great papers that i know don't have that kind of impact factor that doesn't make it any less great okay so if we have that attitude as a scientific community if we decide that we will look for quality and the enhancement of quantity will done along with quality that is a common community decision to make that's not one person's decision if we make that i think we will be in better off position so i would like you know scientific administrators and managers in this community for example what are these international rankings how are they computed how many of them are relevant for our context what are the modifications we need to do for our ranking can we come up with our own ranking right so the the people who have come up with the other ranking they know what quality they expect and what quantity they expect that quality we can take it and supplant it here so yes and 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 we should also not be you know because writing is very difficult and writing a good paper and trying to get it through a good journal is difficult we should not hesitate or be lazy to not do it to that extent i agree that we should try to publish but i don't think there should be any compromise on the quality and the quality is this are we pushing the boundaries are we asking questions which are of relevance are we answering them to the best of our abilities and are we translating them you know it's also an indian institute of technology it's not science finally is it getting translated into something that is measurably improving the quality of life of people excuse me sir yeah so yeah. this sir uh, my question is regarding the reference hmm. uh, i read in some paper in abstract they are also mentioning the uh, reference hmm. so is it correct uh, generally and it second, is not correct and second one is what do you mean by h index yeah so generally it is not a good idea put uh, reference numbers in abstract if at all you want you give the full reference in brackets name journal page number etc uh, and that should be done as sparingly as possible as much as possible you should avoid now h index is if suppose i have say three papers and all three papers have been cited by others three times or more then my h index is 3 that is one paper might be cited for 100 times second paper might be cited for 55 times but if the third paper is cited only three times then i have three papers which have been cited three times or more in other words h index tells you not just you know i publish one great paper then i don't do anything so h index is supposed to distinguish this but the general understanding is that h index is good not for individual persons 
you know, I might publish one great paper, get Nobel Prize, then I might not do anything, but I think that is still okay. I'll be much happier if I got a Nobel Prize and nothing else for the rest of my life. But what is, what is H-index is supposed to measure is, you look at the H-index of all faculty members in a department and another department. That comparison is valid because overall if everybody is doing better, then the H-index will reflect that. That is the hope. But like all things, you know, I said measurement is still subjective in most of science and that makes it very difficult. You should look at impact, H-index, everything, but you should still not be carried away just by numbers. They are finally numbers. You still have to make up your mind about the quality of some work. And that is where you should exercise your scientific <coughs> expertise. And if everybody does that, I think that will automatically happen. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, you have given a lot of good ideas uh, about the writing and those things. My question is uh, on your initial part of your presentation, that is you told ki you should consistently write. That yeah. is write every day at least every five day. sentences. That's, right. That's true with all and uh, I, I guess everybody will agree with me that as we proceed, means when we were students, we used to write something. Right. But as we started our profession, we are a little bit lazy about that. Right. So my question is whether, uh, what are your writing habits, your own writing habits, how you consistently uh, keep yourself motivated to write the things? See, uh, the so easiest thing for me to write is my lecture notes. I always write my lecture notes and publish them you know, in ResearchGate or some online, this thing, uh, some NPTEL, some QEEE course. So one thing that I always try to write is the lecture notes because that is very helpful for me. Previously, I used to maintain a blog, but nowadays I don't do it. Uh, but there is lots of writing that I do along with my students, even though I don't write. They have to write every year their annual progress seminar reports. Then we sometimes have to write papers. Sometimes we have to write thesis and then there are masters and undergrad students in the lab and we try to make them write and along with the PhD students I participate in overseeing that writing activity. One thing that we haven't been very successful is in making lots of technical write-ups and reports and sharing them online. We do some amount of it and that is one of the things that keeps me, you know, involved in writing, uh, but still overall, I mean, I might not write every day five sentences, but over a period of a week, I tend to write at least some five to 10 pages of many different qualities. Sometimes I'm very happy with my writing. Uh, then I go to town sharing with my colleagues saying, okay, I wrote this notes. So it's if you want to take a look at it, or sometimes I put it up online uh, saying that anybody can use it. Sometimes it's not of that great quality. So I, quietly bury it, move on. Nobody knows that I tried writing. So what is actually a lecture notes? Lecture notes is, uh, uh, I will put the objective, then I will ask a question, which is the motivating question for that class. Then I will describe the concept and I will how, explain how that question is answered. Then I will have a few uh, MCQ kind of questions, multiple choice questions, so that the students can test for themselves whether they have understood. And then there is an in-class tutorial, sometimes I make them do in the class or sometimes there are assignments at the end and the solutions are posted separate. So this is something that we try to write uh, and I think if everybody who teaches starts writing this, then it will be really helpful. I found mostly it is helpful for me when I am writing, then I have to be very careful, I have to think through and then I have to process the information in one way, so it is very helpful. It's also helpful for the students because then they have something to... To get uh, scientific papers published in standard or reputed journals, it takes around even one year sometimes. That's right. In spite of it being reviewed at different stages by great scientists, technologists and engineers, still we find some papers getting published with so many common errors. So what is your I mean, suggestion to uh, make all these papers error free because I've gone through so many papers with very common errors like cope up with, discuss about, can be able, uh, one another instead of each other. So there are so many papers, even I have, uh, I mean, uh, done a small research on this. 
still we find a very standard journal papers with more common errors so why don't you suggest to include at least one english faculty as one of the panel members or review reviewers see the problem is ye people are not interested in the english aspects as long as the technical communication happens the yes, journals sir. they are really not too much worried but actually sir in uk papers and us papers we don't find any errors but in not strictly true i have almost 90% in... sir almost 90% but oh, yeah. in most of the reputed journals including i triple e taylor and francis springer science direct there are so many errors So I even I have print screen uh, evidences. Yeah, yeah. No, I I know Absolutely. that there are lots of errors. In spite of getting reviewed at different stages. But but as a reviewer, yes, I never look at English, and if I have any comments about English, I just write that these are the English things they have to correct. But finally, my aim as a technical person is not about the English. I mean, It's Allah about Allah. the so if the English comes in the way of communicating the concept. Yes, sir. Then the paper gets rejected by me. It is a formal document. We feel okay. uh, very sincere. But you see, errors will be there. I mean, how can you avoid it anyway? So. Because it is a formal document. It is in a very reputed journal. I it understand. It can be error-free. No, but see, that's what I'm telling. It's a personal thing, right? I can't go put rules for everybody, and especially when there are no rules for some things, everybody might have their own opinion. Now, simple grammatical errors should they be there? I think they should not be there. But then there is a problem because you know uh, we uh, use only English. For example, if they have, have allowed me to write in my mother tongue, maybe I'll not write grammatically uh, uh, wrong things. So, so scientific communication is basically because somebody who is from anywhere, Japan, so, China, India, um, uh, Brazil, or Egypt, want to communicate a scientific thing. Now, I would like it to be in as much as possible grammatically correct English. but that is still not the primary aim the primary aim is the scientific concept now yes. if english comes in the way of that concept explanation the paper should be rejected if there are other grammatical errors they should be corrected that is why we have editors we have uh, copy setters and we have copy editors and and all these people in spite of all the stages you know still there are some journals where we and have common errors, errors. Yes, sir. i mean i don't think in no industrial process you will have 100% error free things let me put it that way and publication is a major process i don't think you will have error free and the community can find out which are the error free ones and appreciate them i mean that is